Yeah. So to me, one of the most significant findings in neuroscience in the last 75 years is that pleasure and pain are co-located, which means the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain. And they work like a balance. So when we feel pleasure, our balance tips one way. When we feel pain, it tips in the opposite direction. And one of the overriding rules governing this balance is that it wants to stay level. So it doesn't want to remain tipped very long to pleasure or to pain. And with any deviation from neutrality, the brain will work very hard to restore a level balance or what scientists call homeostasis. And the way the brain does that is with any stimulus to one side, there will be a tip in equal and opposite amount to the other side. It's like you have principal laws of physics. Yes, right, yeah. right. So like I like to watch YouTube videos. When I watch YouTube videos of American Idol, you know, it tips to the side of pleasure. And then when I stop watching it, um, I have a come down, right, which is a tip to the equal and opposite amount um, on the other side. And that's that moment of wanting to watch one more YouTube video, right? Well, yeah. And I, w I just want to um, interject there. So this moment of, of wanting to watch another that is associated with pain, I, I think, is are we always aware of that happening? Because you just described it in a very conscious way. right? But when I um, indulge in something I enjoy... I'm usually thinking about just wanting more of yes, that thing. Yes. I don't think about the pain. I just yes. think about more. Right. right. So really excellent point because we're mostly not aware of it. And it's also reflexive. So we it's not something that consciously happens or that we're aware of unless we really begin to pay attention. And, and when we begin to pay attention, we really can become very aware of it in the moment. Again, it's like a falling away, like that, you know, you're on social media and, you know, you get a good tweet of something and then you can't stop yourself because there's this awareness, a latent awareness that as soon as I disengage from this behavior, I'm going to experience a, a kind of a pain, right? A falling away, a, a missing that feeling, a wanting more of it. And of course, one way to combat that is to do it more, right? And more and more and more. So I think, I think that is really what I want people to tune into and, and get an awareness around because once you tune into it, you can see it a lot. And then when you begin to see it, you have, and if you, you know, keep the model of the balance in mind, I think it, it gives people kind of a way to imagine what they're experiencing on a neurobiological level and understand it. And in that understanding, get some mastery over it, which is really what this is all about. Because ultimately, we do need to disengage, right? We can't live in that space all the time, right? We have other things we need to do. And there are also serious consequences that come with trying to repeat and continue that experience or that feeling. Yeah. So if I understand this correctly, uh, when we find something or when something finds us <laughs> that we enjoy, that feels pleasurable, uh, social media, food, right. sex, gambling, mm -hmm. whatever it happens to be, and we will explore the full range of these there's a some dopamine release when we engage right. in that behavior. Mm -hmm. And then what you're telling me is that very quickly, yes, and beneath my conscious awareness, mm -hmm. there's a tilting back of the scale where pleasure is reduced by way of increasing pain. Right. And I've heard you say before that the pain mechanism has some competitive advantages over the pleasure mechanism such that it doesn't just bring the scale back to level. Mm. It actually brings pain higher mm. than pleasure. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, so what happens, again, so the, the, the hallmark of any addictive substance or behavior is that it releases a lot of dopamine in our brain's reward pathway, like, right? Like broccoli just doesn't release a lot of dopamine, just doesn't, right? The, I'm trying to imagine, <laughs> I was about to say, maybe there, and I, I stopped myself because, no, bro broccoli is good. It can be yeah. really good, but broccoli. Right. Broccoli is never amazing. Right. Broccoli is no. never, never amazing. Like, this is I the mean, most amazing broccoli. Honestly, we can probably find somebody on the planet yeah. for whom broccoli is amazing. And of course, if I'm starving, broccoli, yeah. broccoli is amazing. Yeah. Rich right? Roll. So. Rich Roll is big on plants <laughs> yeah, right. and he he has a good <laughs> relationship to plants. Uh, right. Rich, I, tell us how to make broccoli amazing. <laughs> if anyone could do it, it'd be rich. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, but, but what happens right after I do something that is really pleasurable and releases a lot of dopamine is again, my brain is going to immediately compensate by 
down-regulating my own dopamine receptors, my own dopamine transmission to compensate for that, okay? And that's that come down or the hangover, or that after effect, that moment of wanting to do it more. Now, if I just wait for that feeling to pass, then my dopamine will re-regulate itself and I'll go back to whatever my chronic baseline is. But if I don't wait, and here's really the key, if I keep indulging again and again and again, ultimately, I have I have so much on the pain side, right, that I've essentially reset my brain to what we call like an anhedonic or lacking in joy type of state, which is a dopamine deficit state. So that's really the the, the, the way in which pain can become the main driver is because I've indulged so much in these high reward behaviors or substances that my brain has had to compensate by way down regulating my own dopamine such that even when I'm not doing that drug, I'm in a dopamine deficit state, which is akin to a clinical depression. I, I have anxiety, irritability, insomnia, dysphoria, and a lot of mental preoccupation with using again or getting the drug. And so that, that's the piece there. There's the single use, which easily passes, but it's the chronic use that can then reset really our dopamine thresholds, and then nothing is enjoyable, mm -hmm. right? That Then everything sort of pales in comparison to this one drug that I want to keep doing. 